Hi, this is Susan Kellogg Spot. I'm Professor of OBGYN at Drexel University College of Medicine and Director of Female Sexual Medicine at the Center for Pelvic Medicine in Rosemont, Pennsylvania. It's my pleasure to join you today to talk about hypoactive sexual desire disorder, something that's very real for many of our patients, and hopefully I'll be giving you some tips to help your patients through this distressing disorder. Uh, for the purpose of disclosure, I receive consulting fees from AMAG Pharmaceuticals, Materna, Symbiomix, Valiant Pharmaceuticals, and I'm a speaker for Dujanet and Valiant Pharmaceuticals. You know, research suggests that about 10% of women of all ages are distressed because they have low sexual desire. I know you've heard these comments from patients in your practice. So what do you currently do when a patient presents with hypoactive sexual desire disorder or HSDD? Nothing. Recommend psychological counseling. Offer off-label treatments like testosterone. Offer the only approved medication for premenopausal women with hypoactive sexual desire disorder or explain that there are no current medications approved for hypoactive sexual desire disorder. I'm sure that there's a plethora of answers available. So just think about what your answer to this question would be, and maybe it's more than one. And let's go through some of the data on hypoactive sexual desire disorder and see what you think when we're finished with today's presentation. So the objectives today are going to talk about the symptoms of HSTD and cite barriers to the appropriate diagnosis. We're going to be looking a little bit about taking a history and using screening tools. We're going to explain causal factors for HSTD and then identify uh, the FDA mandated risk evaluation and mitigation strategy for the use of the only therapeutic modality that is prescriptive for managing HSDD. In addition, we're going to talk at length about counseling strategies to enhance the care of our patients with HSDD. You know, women have ranked having a healthy sex life higher than they rank things like career satisfaction and home ownership and the ability to travel and have an active social life. You know, those things are, that's pretty weighty measurement if we look at the fact that it's so important to women to have a healthy sex life. And the vast majority of women actually believe that they're having too little sex in their current relationship. Women with low sexual desire are 8 to 10 times more likely than women with normal desire to report feeling unhappy, disappointed, frustrated, ashamed, and even bitter. So it's really a real problem. This is not in something that women make up or that even healthcare providers make up. It's a real deal, and it really uh, upsets people quite a bit, upsetting their f sense of themselves, but also their sense of themselves within relationship. You know, loss of sexual desire has similar quality of life burdens on a general health impact as things like chronic conditions like diabetes and back pain. And it's, we all know that sex is actually pretty critical to the survival of a relationship. Barry McCarthy, a very famous sex therapist, once said, you know, when sex is good in an otherwise good relationship, it adds about 15 to 20 percent additional value to that relationship. But when sex is bad or non-existent, which he defined as less than 10 instances of sexual play per year, uh, it, play, it can play a really inordinately powerful role and drain an otherwise good relationship of all of its positive value by about 50 to 70 percent. In other words, it can be a deal breaker. It can really upset an otherwise good relationship. And um, p women know this. They feel this within relationship. This is one of the reasons they're so distressed when they have low desire. When we look at some online survey, survey data by Kingsburg and colleagues, we, we asked premenopausal women, or she did ask premenopausal women, with self-described low desire, what kind of things, how did it affect their lives? 69% said that it affected their, their body image, with 50% saying it really kind of eroded their self-confidence, and 33% saying that it affected negatively their self-worth. More importantly, even that is the effect on the relationship, 67%, a resounding percent, said they felt less connected with their partner, and they just didn't really want that to continue to go on because they could feel that erosion in the relationship. 35% also said they felt like they had, they had less communication with their partner and frankly were worried that their partner might find um, a partner outside of their own dyadic relationship and actually kind of cheat on them. Those are terrible, terrible feelings for women to have. 
you know, HSD isn't anything that's new. It's a well-defined, long-recognized condition. It was first actually noticed in the medical literature, noted, I should say, in 1977. Um, and it was defined by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in 1987. Today, HSCD is defined as persistent or recurrent deficient or absent sexual fantasies and or desire for sexual activity accompanied by clinically significant distress. And it's not otherwise accounted for by general medical or psych conditions. HSDD subtypes are lifelong or acquired, generalized, or situational. Lifelong would be that a patient had HSDD for as long as she can remember her entire life. And acquired speaks more to HSDD that occurs after a woman feels that she has normal, healthy sexual desire and then something changes. Generalized HSDD is feeling lack of desire in pretty much all instances, whether she's home, on vacation, whether she's uh, feeling well rested or tired. And situation would be just the opposite. It would be the HSDD only under certain conditions. The DSM-4 noted that HSDD um, had its own diagnosis code and was separate and distinct from female sexual arousal disorder. But actually the DSM-5 shows that they're, they were combined and they combined them to state that female sexual interest in arousal disorder uh, could be really considered as one component. So however one looks at this disorder, it is a common disorder, it's a real disorder, and we need to do something to help patients. So why should you open Pandora's box and address sexual function? We have enough to do in gynecology and neurology or whatever your specialty is. But you know what? Sexual problems are so common. And when you ask about them, it legitimizes and validates the problem with your patient. They might be hesitant to bring up the topic, but if you bring up the topic, they're very likely to, number one, be relieved, and number two, enter into a dialogue with you about it. Assessing sexual function actually improves patient satisfaction with your care as their health care provider. When you're asking about sexual function and desire, it's really important to know that there are so many contributors to desire problems. There's things like in the purple at the top, there are past history of disappointing or negative outcomes, um, lack of privacy or safety within a relationship or within a home environment, uh, hit past history of trauma, um, that could be sexual, physical, or, and or medical trauma even, and negative emotions like fear, anxiety, and shame. If there's relationship discord or absence of emotional intimacy, that can certainly contribute to a desire problem. And if there's lack of appropriate stimuli or some type of partner sexual dysfunction, this can, this can contribute as well. Not to be ever left out would be an imbalance in neurotransmitters, the neurotransmitters specifically dopamine and serotonin an imbalance or a, a shift in sex hormones, testosterone, progesterone, and estrogen, and then a past history of medical illness and or fatigue. So it's really important to look at all the pieces of the puzzle to help a patient decide and to help you decide what your game plan is going to be to help them. In addition, when a patient has low desire, it might very well affect other parts of her relationship, of her sexual relationship. She might feel low desire. She might feel that she has uh, difficulty reaching orgasm or tightness and tautness in the pelvic floor muscles or dryness in the vagina termed dyspruenia and or vaginismus. So it's really important to look at this overlap and ask patient about how her low desire affects other aspects of her sexual function. And on the flip side, how something like dyspruenia or sexual pain could actually be the culprit when we look at desire disorders because nobody desires actively something that's going to hurt. In terms of types of interventions, um, we're going to spend a fair amount of time today talking about psychotherapy and counseling techniques, pharmacotherapies, combined therapy, and then treatment defined by etiology. So first let's look a little bit at sexual counseling. You know, um, psychotherapy with a chief complaint of a sexual problem is based on principles of learning and cognitive processing as a mechanism of change. Although the stated goal when one is in sex therapy or conducting sex therapy is to correct the sexual problem that the patient is having problems with, sex therapy in and of itself does not focus fully, solely on sexual activity and sexual function, not just on the, quote, mechanics of sex. It actually really addresses the biopsychosocial model of sexuality, and it the treatment is going to follow that model. For instance, when we're doing specific techniques from a psychotherapeutic 
intervention perspective in a, in a, psych, in a sex therapy setting, we're going to do things to lessen performance anxiety. One of the first things that we do in sex therapy at my practice is we decrease the performance anxiety of having to have sexual play in the form of intercourse you know, a certain number of times per week or per month, but actually decrease that by saying, you know what, how about if you take traditional sexual play off the table and just start to learn, relearn how to kiss and to hug and to really talk about your feelings and to hold one another as a form of sexual intimacy. We also help the patients cognitively restructure what they think is going on in terms of their low desire. Does the low desire have to do with, uh, with pain, as I mentioned before? Does it have to do with outside depression or feeling as though um, one just is, is, is actually even bored in a relationship? Could be any of those things. Or has the woman started to understand herself as well, something like, quote, I'm just not a sexual person. That's just not me, end of quote. Is that really who she is? Is that how she has begun to self-defined? Does she feel a lot of pressure from her partner to be sexual? So all of those things are actually kind of really looked at very um, in detail before we do anything in terms of making assignments or suggesting that sexual function change in some way. Also, if there's some old issues, if there's past issues of trauma or past issues of um, maybe bad experience with sexual play from a previous partner, we talk about those things and how they've come into the bedroom, if you will, of this new couple and how they're influencing a woman's sexual function. We work, again, usually in non-coital type assignments. Again, we're stroking, hugging, kissing, those kind of things. To have, have a woman rebuild her confidence that she can be sexually interested and reconnect to her own sensual self through a series usually of assignments and homework assignments. Um, we talk to the patient and her partner if they're both there about barriers to intimacy. Do they have time? Do they have privacy? Do they actually make places in their very, very busy schedules to make sure that they have time to, to be intimate with one another. Not uncommonly, we talk to women who feel like they just absolutely don't have time to be intimate. And we ask them things about, well, do you have time to get to the gym? Or do you have time to, be, to work on time? Or do you have time to be at your children's soccer game? And often, Often we hear things like, well, yeah, I've got time for that. I put that in my, my calendar and I make sure that I make that soccer game or I go to the gym two nights a week. And we talk to them about what it would be like if they would make that same kind of a commitment, even on a calendar, to make time for intimacy with their partner and how that might possibly de-stress and actually increase the whole thought of having sexual play more openly and regularly. It also increases communication between partners if they know that they're going to have a dedicated time to be together in an intimate way. When uh, patients graduate, if you will, from sex therapy, we talk about how to minimize or prevent relapse as well, what kind of things going forward would help you stay on point with making time for intimacy. When we look at cognitive behavioral therapy, this is another technique that is used for hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, focuses on identifying and altering behaviors. If patients say things like, oh, I don't go to bed till 2 in the morning, I make sure my partner is asleep so that I can avoid sexual activity, and or if they have unrealistic expectations such that, you know, I, I um, just my partner wants to be sexual all the time and I just, I'm not that person and this is an unsurmountable problem. We really kind of deconstruct those thoughts and think, well, what would happen if in fact you actually talked about this and decided what would be a, a happy medium, perhaps uh, making time for sexual intimacy and sexual play once a week or once every other week. And then as long as you both understand what's expected, if you will, that it's really much easier to approach that table of intimacy rather than making assumptions about what the other person, quote, wants or doesn't want, quote, all the time. Education is a really important component of CBT, and it helps a couple understand how adequate erotic stimulation and physical stimulation really can build to a woman's sexual desire and arousal, and how women need adequate time to feel, to kind of unwind, really relax their brain, relax their body, and feel endogenous sexual desire and arousal. 
because cognitive distraction actually prevents a lot of women from being sexual because they're thinking other types of thoughts. Maybe they're thoughts of, I've got to get to work. I can't, don't have time for this. Uh, what's in the dryer right now? What am I making for lunches tomorrow? Or those irrational thoughts like, I'll never be sexual. I don't belong to be in a relationship. I, I just, this is just never going to work. Those kind of cognitive distraction and um, really thoughts that aren't pro-sexual really don't serve women as they attempt to increase their um, or address their hypoactive sexual desire. And really deconstructing these and challenging them and replacing them with more rational thoughts and more doable thoughts help uh, women in, as a mainstay of sex therapy. And it really helps them to focus at least for just a few moments to be mindful of the task at hand, which is really connecting with their partner. And at the end of the day, that's what they really want as well. Speaking of mindfulness, mindfulness is one of the CBT uh, therapy programs as well. This is, mindfulness is a, kind of a fancy word just for focusing on being present without judgment. It includes having a patient really clear her mind of all those thoughts of, again, what's in the dryer and what's going on for work and this is never going to work and what should I do and really quiet her body and quiet her mind to think about um, her bodily sensations as she relaxes and enjoys the erotic stimulation, uh, whether that's uh, thoughts, feeling, you know, filling her mind with sexual fantasies or thoughts, or feeling the stimulation that she, either she herself or her partner is um, providing. That doesn't have to be genital stimulation. It could just be, you know, a, a back rub. It could be stroking of the hair. It could be um, just a gentle, um, like a soft touch on the arm, something like that. Really feeling, focusing on bodily sensations that are pleasurable in any way and getting lost in them rather than trying to constantly feeling pressure to have intercourse or something like that. We know that theoretically there are actually neuroplastic changes in the brain that can be um, associated with turning one's attention and emotion and self-awareness to intimate thoughts and behaviors and quieting the mind and being mindful of this. So these are actually semi-permanent changes that can happen, um, and patients are actually quite surprised to hear that that can be the case. In the office, when we're doing counseling, it's really important to kind of get permission from the patient to talk about sexual issues and give them information about the, uh, their sexual anatomy. It is shocking and uh, dismaying sometimes to find out how many women are not completely clear on where their genital anatomy is and what the purpose of things like the labia and the clitoral hood, the clitoral body, and the introitus is. We often will give educational resources but do a, an examination holding a mirror and showing a patient her genital anatomy. Then we make specific suggestions like things like using lubricants and moisturizers, altering sexual positions so that patients are more comfortable, but also that they have more stimulation in areas that feel good or don't feel good, being careful to be sure that they're comfortable um, in positions and that they know that they can alter position. Not everybody needs to be in missionary woman on bottom position and that sometimes sideline can be a really gentle way to play and really comfortable for a lot of patients. And surprisingly, they don't often think of that on their own. If a patient needs intensive psychotherapy, particularly through that history of trauma, or if the relationship is in such a place of disrepair that um, you think that a patient needs therapy, please do refer them for intensive either sex therapy or psychotherapy. You can do this by uh, going on to the uh, ASECT website, that's aasect.org, and finding a, a provider in the zip code from where you practice. You can also do this by going on the ISWISH website, which is isswsh.org, and going into the Find a Provider space uh, for where you live. But, um, don't be a, afraid to refer a patient out if you think that their requirement for psychotherapy exceeds your ability to give it. So we, we're talking about a little bit today, about, a lot about today, all the things you can do to be supportive and psychologically holding the patient up with techniques like CBT and mindfulness. These are simple but very powerful techniques. Making time for sexual play, prioritizing sexual play with a partner, seeing oneself as a sexual person rather than as a quote failure, end of quote. But there are wonderful FDA approved pharmacologic options, particularly one, for hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And we'll talk about that for the next few moments. 
So flibantrin is a mixed postsynaptic 5-HT1A agonist and 5-HT2A antagonist. A 5-HT1 agonist has prosexual effects uh, contributing to serotonin pathways that produce a sense of calm and well-being. A 5-HT2 antagonist produces prosexual effects by actually altering that sense of sexual satiety or fullness so the patient doesn't feel so full of or not hungry, shall we say, for any kind of sexual play or intimate play. Flibantrin also has activity at the dopamine D4 receptor as well as moderate affinity for HT2B and HT2C receptors. It's thought to produce region-specific elevations in dopamine and norepinephrine, which we know are prosexual neurotransmitters, and these offset inhibitory serotonergic activity. The net gain is that it, it uh, increases desire pathways in the brain and balance neurotransmitters for patients who just don't feel that sense of hunger for sexual play and intimacy. Serotonin might have a role in the low desire by acting as the sexual satiety signal. And so this drug works to decrease that sexual satiety signal. And patients, once again, very gently have a sense of sexual hunger or wanting intimacy. Flibantrin has uh, been tested in several trials on one of the largest clinical trial programs ever done for sexual medicine for women. And they, it consistently improves sexual desire versus placebo. You can see in these three pivotal studies, study one, which included over 500 patients, study two, which included over 700 patients, and study three, which included over 1,000 patients and um, equally split that in the phlebanserin versus placebo group. You can see in the phlebanserin group, which is the bright pink, that it consistently um, produced more sexual desire, improved sexual desire over placebo in all three studies studies. In addition, flibanserin shows a decrease in distress versus placebo across all three studies, again with the pink showing a decrease in distress, which was significant over placebo. This is really one of the main issues, isn't it? When you talk to patients about their low distress, they say things like, oh, Dr. Kellogg, it's like the elephant in the room. It's Friday night or it's Saturday night or it's Sunday morning at my house and I just feel this incredible sense of dread because I don't have any desire and I'm letting my partner down yet again. This is the, the actual words that they use. And when we talk about decreasing that distress, it actually is so fulfilling for patients to finally not feel that anymore. Flibanserin is contraindicated with the use of alcohol and with concomitant use of moderate to, so, to strong CYP3A4 inhibitors, also in patients with hepatic impairment. It's important to talk to your patients about um, staying away from alcohol while they're on flibanserin. And flibanserin does have a REMS program, which is a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy, during which time the patient uh, talks to the provider about abstaining from alcohol, they actually sign a contract with the provider to this effect, and the provider needs to be REMS certified in order to prescribe flibanserin, as does the pharmacist who will fill that prescription for flibanserin. This provides safety for patients across the board when they're going to use this very novel drug for low desire. On the horizon, we have another drug that is um, of interest. This is bremelanotide, or BMT. This is still in its investigational stage. It's a novel cyclic 7 amino acid melanocortin receptor agonist with high affinity for type 4 melanocortin receptors and an analog of the alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. BMT is delivered via auto-injector on an as-desired basis. Um, they performed two pivotal reconnect studies. Um, they were two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase 3 studies of BMT administered as desired for the treatment of HSCD in premenopausal women. Relative to placebo and to um, validated scales, we saw that BMT increased sexual desire scores within the first month of double-blind treatment. You'll see the BMT is noted here in the, in the darker pink color and the placebo in darker gray. In the, both of the studies, you can see the placebo um, clearly was inferior to active treatment with BMT. Following a sensitivity analysis that assumed all dropouts in the study were treatment failures, 
The effect size decreased somewhat, but still the results show statistically significant improvement in comparison to placebo. So hopefully someday this will be on the market as well. We'll have someday two active treatments in addition to sex therapy and CBT for women with low desire. In our practices, HSDD is very prevalent. It presents a huge burden to the quality of life of women who suffer from this condition. It is the responsibility of the healthcare professional to initiate discussion of sexual concerns with all patients, to offer them options, to initiate cognitive behavioral therapy, office counseling, and or refer them for sex therapy and more advanced psychotherapy if it's appropriate. And when the patients are appropriate candidates for use of flavanserin or someday of BMT, to initiate the discussion about the safety concerns around those medications, their wonderful efficacy for, the, for these disorders, and give patients a choice for the first time to address their own low desire and to decrease their own distress. Thank you so much for listening today, and I um, have a good day ahead and treat those patients with low desire. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Spat. You're welcome. It's Kellogg's Spot. And these are my disclosures. what you wanted me to do? So. Yes, thank you. Yeah? Okay. Yep, okay. that was it. All righty, gotcha. Perfect. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, you can do the magic. <laughs> if you need me to do anything else, let me know. Um, yeah. But, you know, hopefully, I wanted the real heavy em emphasis on partner, on counseling techniques and partner, um, the, the what happens in the house, what ha like real honest to God pa patient quotes, and that's where I think I took you, hopefully into into the actual life of the patient. So, yes, it, it was really a great presentation. Thank you very much. Good, sure, indeed. All right. Well, if you need anything else, let me know. Okay. We will. Absolutely. Okay. Thank All right. You. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay. Um, Sorry, so, I don't know if you might have told you. One second. So, um, Ashley, if you could send us the recording to our email, or Amanda, I believe it was. Still there? Yes, I am. Sorry, I was talking to my mute button. I am still here, and I can send the recording, yes. Yes, yeah, so um, do you have the email that you're going to be sending that to? Um, you can give it to me. I'll just make sure it's the same one. Excellent. So we want to send that to info at herdesire.net, H-E-R-D-E-S-I-R-E dot -E -E net. Info at herdesire.net. Correct. All right. Right, perfect. Well, well, thank you very much, and we uh, look forward to doing future webcasts with you in the future. All right. Thanks. Have a great day. All right, thank you. You too.